everyone. We are back here for episode 12 of the Beyond the Whistle podcast. We are actually losing one member today due to technical difficulties. I'm Dylan Pescatore. I'm here with Cortland Parrott. We're going to do a little two-man interview today. We're here with the wonderful Miss Kate Scott, an inspirational announcer in the business. Kate, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. So the first question that pretty much we have to ask everyone in these tough times, how are you doing during this uh, coronavirus system? Well, thank you for asking. Um, I'm doing great. I feel so incredibly fortunate uh, to still have a job with the Pac-12 Network and with NBC, um, to have a house, to have financial stability, um, to have a dog who's keeping me entertained at home and to not have kids. It sounds like all of my friends who have kids at home and are still trying to get work done are kind of going insane. Um, so just so thankful for everything I have and then thankful, obviously, for all of our healthcare workers and everybody at the grocery stores and making deliveries and stuff. So in comparison to a lot of folks, I'm in a great spot. Thanks for asking you guys. Anytime. And we want to start out, you know, there's not many uh, experienced female announcers in the broadcasting world. So how did you get into broadcasting and how, what was your sports life like young? Was there any parental influential there? You grew up in California. So what was that childhood like? Yeah, my childhood was filled with sports, you guys. And I, and I, know, I know some places in the country, um, this is still possible, but I lived on a block where there was tons of kids and it was safe enough where our parents kind of just let us play outside all day during the summer. You know, we had four or five basketball hoops on the street. We had bases spray painted in the street. There were so many kids there. So it was, you know, we would get our homework done in the afternoon during the school year and we all run outside. What sport do we want to play today? Are we playing basketball? Are we playing baseball? Are we playing street hockey? I used to be a goalie on our street hockey team, just using my baseball mitt. Um, so it was tons of fun as a little kid growing up like that. And then I went on and played four varsity sports in high school, um, soccer, basketball, tennis, and track and field. So that was everything. Was planning to go to high school or planning to go to college um, on a college uh, soccer scholarship because soccer was my travel sport, my serious sport. And then like a lot of athletes, um, wrecked my knee my junior year of high school. So that kind of ended the sports career, but it also was a blessing in disguise. Now I can say that. Obviously I was upset and pissed at the time, <laughs> but um, my senior year of high school, I started journalism for the first time. I started writing for our high school newspaper and fell in love with it because I was able to still be involved with all the sports, right? I was going to the games and the meets and getting to hang out with all of my friends who are the athletes and kind of feel like I was behind the scenes and a part of things. And I also loved writing. So it was a great way to feed and, and kind of scratch both of those itches. So I went to Cal, um, UC Berkeley out here in California, knowing that I wanted to be a sports journalist. I didn't know exactly how, because obviously I'd done, I'd done print, but I wasn't as actually at exactly sure how. So I did a little bit of everything when I was in college. I did more print. I got into interning for our Cal Highlight Show. After I graduated, I went into radio because I was intrigued by that as well. Fell in love with radio because it didn't matter what you look like. Didn't have to put on makeup. You could just wear your ball cap and show up to work. And it just mattered if you could talk sports and what you knew. Um, so I actually was a radio traffic reporter for five years after college. Nothing to do with sports, right? Uh, which was very trying. It was uh, a lot of days and nights of wondering how the heck I was going to transition into sports. And then slowly the sports started to happen. Got my first gig in sports radio, then started doing television sideline reporting like a lot of women do. Uh, emailed my reel out to people at ESPN and NBC and, and people that I knew. And, and that was the first time somebody said, hey, have you thought about play-by-play? -play? Because it, as you guys mentioned, they, there really wasn't that many women and there still aren't that many women doing play-by-play. -play. So I never thought of it as something that I could do. I just thought if I want to be a woman working in sports, I can be a sideline reporter or an anchor. That's it. And I loved the live aspect. So I really wanted to be in the field, which meant sideline reporting until I got the feedback from those higher ups saying, you have a great voice. You seem to really know a lot of different sports. Have you thought about play-by-play? -play? And the thing that held me back initially was, man, I feel like I've made so much progress in sports radio and sideline reporting. And now I have to learn this whole new skill, which I feel like is going to set me back a couple of years to learn all the things that, as you guys know, a lot of guys 
went to college for that because there were so many guys that they had to look up to. So they knew what they wanted to do a long time before me. So I, I made the decision, obviously, thankfully now, to kind of spend those couple of years getting my feet wet, learning a new skill, making mistakes. And here we are now, almost a decade later, and I'm getting to call crazy things like NHL games and NFL games and college sports. So uh, that's kind of the, the summary of things, which I know was still longer than you guys wanted, but thanks for letting me go on. Of course. I mean, we talk about you doing professional sports and I wanted to get right into the NHL all-female broadcast that happened just la uh, this year. It feels like a year ago, actually. <laughs> last month, last year, I know. When was it? I've lost all track of time, With too. The Blues facing the Blackhawks. No, I turned it on. I believe it was a Sunday afternoon, and uh, I turned it on. I was like, this is a new announcing team, but I kind of like it. You know, it was, a new <laughs> it was a new perspective, and you were with A.J. Malesko, who currently does um, on-ice reporting for the Islanders, and mm -hmm. Kendall coyne Schofield, the former player who everyone talks about when they talk about women hockey. So I wanted to go into the women hockey field and the NWHL, who just added a Toronto team, their sixth team in the league. So can you just talk about how women women in hockey are just starting to grow? Yeah, and it was such an honor and a privilege to be a part of that broadcast. Thanks for tuning in and not turning it off as soon as you heard that it wasn't, you know, Doc Emmerich on the call. Um, but it has been so cool to watch the last couple of years, um, the growth since really – Kendall did that fastest lap, right, at the NHL All-Star game a couple of years ago. That really propelled them to kind of the forefront of the news cycle, which, as we all know, is so important in sports because women's sports get covered so much less than men's sports. So that kind of made them a talking point, which was so important. And then the NHL latched onto that because I've learned since agreeing to do the NHL game and really diving into hockey the last four or five months that the growth of women's hockey from kids playing at an early age to what it is now has been exponential like the last 10 years. There was, you know, a couple thousand young girls playing when Kendall and AJ were growing up and now there's hundreds of thousands and the growth is just through the roof. So smartly, because the NHL is a business, they wanted to capitalize on that. And that's why this year they brought Kendall and a bunch of her Team USA teammates and Team Canada together to play that three on three game at the NHL All-Star game this season in St. Louis. So the growth has been really incredible. Um, it was so cool to work with both AJ and Kendall because we always talk about when it comes to women's sports, the 99 women's soccer team, right? Because of what they did for that sport. Well, AJ was on the 98 women's hockey team, which was kind of the one that broke them. So they won gold. They ended Team Canada's reign at the Olympics. And it was so cool because Kendall said she grew up idolizing people like AJ. That was the team that got her into hockey, Cameron Granado and so many other players on that team. So that connection was really neat to make the connection between just the growth of women's hockey as a whole. And that was why NBC wanted to do this broadcast. They saw that the NHL as a sport was saying, hey, we, we have so many female hockey fans, so many young women who are playing this sport. We got to build on this. We got to grow this. Um, and the NBC folks said, you know, a great way to do this would be on International Women's Day. You know, we have so many women who work in hockey already. And that was the really neat thing for me, because I'm sure you guys read. My initial reaction to this opportunity was, I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't want to be involved in this stunt, right? Like, why are we bringing women together just to say women can do this? And thankfully, the folks at NBC said, Kate, shut up. This isn't about you. Everybody else but you uh, works on our NHL broadcast year round. And I learned that really the night before. We went out to dinner as a group in Chicago and, you know, met this woman, Denise, who's been running camera for the St. Louis Blues for 35 years. I mean, think about that. I'm 37. She's been working NHL games for 35 years. Met a woman from LA who's worked um, Kings and, and Ducks games since they launched for over 20 years. You know, I met a woman who does graphics for the Colorado Avalanche and somebody else works for the Panthers. And there was a woman who lives with me in the Bay Area, works for the Sharks. So all of them have been doing this forever. This was just a way for everyone to see because most of the time, again, we're one off. So there's one woman in that truck. There's AJ on the Islanders broadcast. There's Kendall on the Sharks broadcast. So we just, for this one day, Wanted to bring everything I mentioned together, all the women who've played, all the women who are getting into the sport, all the women who are fans of the sport. Just let them see you don't have to be a gold medalist to be involved. You don't have to be a former player like AJ and Kendall to work on broadcasts. You could call the game like me. You could 
direct a broadcast. You could produce a broadcast. You could be a tape producer. You can do graphics. You can be a stage manager. And that was really what they wanted to highlight that day. I think they did a pretty darn good job. And it was so cool also to see TSN and Sportsnet folks in Canada do the same thing to just kind of expand the reach that much more. So just, again, humbled, honored to be a part of that and really excited to see what the NHL does with, does with this moving forward once we get past this pandemic. Yeah, it was cool to see. Uh, I know at our high school, we have a pretty good girls hockey program. They've had a lot of success and a lot of play. So it's kind of cool to see how in the future they could be playing professional sports. Yeah. And going on to, you know, the calling in the game, I feel like, especially not just in broadcast in the world, if there's a woman in the workplace, there's been tons of movements about equal play and all this, but there's troubles where, you know, they're not as respected enough. And to have a broadcast that really shows that, hey, all girls and all ladies can do this broadcast and they can do it to a great, and it, there was nothing changing from a normal broadcast to this one. It looked the same, it sounded the same, you know, maybe the voice pitch was different, but it still looked fantastic. Um, and then one thing that we've been asking, uh, you know, some of the podcasters is how did they got into podcasting? You have the update with Kate Scott in the Bay mm -hmm. Area. So how did you move into podcasting and uh, that realm of media? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm so embarrassed by the name. I just wanted it to be the update. And they said, no, we have to put your name in it. And I said, guys, that's so embarrassing. But it is what it is, just because, again, I, I kind of got my start in sports here in the Bay Area in radio. So now folks in the Bay Area kind of know that name. That's why they wanted to include it anyway. Um, but that was kind of how I got into podcasting, too. So about a year ago. Um, the folks at the Athletic Bay Area approached me and said, hey, we have this idea. Do you listen to the New York Times, the daily podcast? And I actually did. Uh, and they said, really just kind of want to do something like that for sports here in the Bay Area. It's not going to be sports radio. So it's not going to be, you know, the Warriors won the night before the Giants lost. Let's discuss it the next day. It's going to be more the stories behind the stories. So, you know, Stephen Curry's in a bit of a slump. Let's talk to the head beat writer for the Warriors and get kind of the behind the scenes stuff. And let's weave in some bites that he's recorded from Steph recently uh, to explain what's going on, to kind of tell that story. And they said, and we just think because of your sports radio background, because you've worked for literally every team here in the Bay Area, and I have, <laughs> I've worked with the San Jose Earthquakes, the MLS team, the 49ers, the Giants, you know, and they said, we just feel like you have a voice that everybody knows and respects at this point when it comes to discussing any of the teams here. Would you be interested? And I'd been thinking about podcasting for a while because as you guys just said, I mean, it feels like everybody has a podcast these days. Mm -hmm. But that was always my response as to why I didn't want to just do a podcast because it feels like everybody has a podcast. Like, what's my angle? What's the shtick that's going to make it any different than everybody else's? Um, and as a fan of great sports journalism, I'm a big fan of The Athletic because I think they do a fabulous job of, of top, top notch sports journalism. So uh, we talked about it uh, and we started it uh, in December and it's been going three days a week since, which is a ton of work. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't know. I knew that when I said yes, um, that I was going to do a lot more than just doing, you know, 10 to 12 minute interviews because they're not live. So we do the interviews and then we listen back to them. We trim them as much as we can, edit them down. We're trying to weave in sounds. Sometimes there's music beds. And as a perfectionist <laughs> and also somebody whose name is on the podcast and whose voice is the podcast, right? It's going to be a reflection of me. Um, so we put a lot of effort into making them sound as polished and good as possible, which is different than a lot of podcasts as well, which are just a couple of folks talking. There's echoes. It doesn't sound that great, but, but I wanted this to sound as professional and polished as possible, knowing it was going to be a reflection of me. So that's how I got into it. And it's been great because again, I've been missing radio. There's just an intimacy to talking to people without TV is kind of, you're talking at people, whereas radio and podcasting it kind of feels like you're with them you're just hanging out with a friend either in your car or you know it gets to where you're in taking that that medium and with tv some people do it in the bathroom but not that many people do more more people listen to the radio or listen to podcasts as they're right getting ready for work or whatever it is um so that's how i got into it still learning still making mistakes every week but really enjoying it i mean we created this podcast earlier in the year and now we see podcasts just blow up i mean sometimes yeah talk to kids and they want to talk about podcasts more than they do TV shows. I mean, it's crazy. And now I just really wanted to get into 
the criticism topic, you know, something that really all of us deal with. You know, we have technical issues. We sometimes mess up. I know during my hockey broadcast, I say something wrong and I beat myself up over it for days, weeks on end. So how do you deal with criticism as it comes about? Well, I learned early in my career that being a public figure, right? If you guys want to do this or anybody who wants to do radio, TV, any of this, print, your name's out there you are working just like everybody else, but it's very public. Whereas you think about some of our friends, right? To, you know, my wife works in architecture and design and she makes mistakes and they're awful, but really they're only known about internally. So a couple of teammates may know about it, but it's not like people are tweeting out her mistakes or able to respond in that way. So it was a shock at first and it really had to build up a thick skin. That's really what it comes down to. And then once I did that, um, and it's still, you know, I still get criticisms and stuff and it still hurts, but you have to realize, at least for me, um, that I needed to pay attention to the criticism of, again, the people that I respect. I keep coming back to that word respect, right? Fellow broadcasters, producers, directors, people who I want to be like or who I enjoy their work. Um, you know, why did they think that something I said or did wasn't right? And then learn from that. Because again, we all make mistakes. I actually um, just recently got talked about in a Richard Deitch um, sports media column on The Athletic. I, I thought it was a great idea. He reached out to a ton of different play-by-play -play broadcasters in all different sports about mistakes we've made. And even though I knew that people I looked up to have made mistakes, it was really great to read this piece about everybody making mistakes. So we do. Um, so this is a bit roundabout way of saying, just kind of have to accept it and take it with a grain of salt. And, you know, if people tell me I suck on Twitter or Instagram, that's not really helpful. But, you know, I got some, I got some emails after the Blues Blackhawks game. And one guy said, you know, I was incredibly biased towards the Blackhawks. What is, I'm such a Chicago homer. He said all this stuff. Um, and it, he seemed to take such time and effort to send that, that I said, okay, I'm going to write this guy back just to see. And I thanked him for his email and I apologized that he didn't enjoy the broadcast. I didn't apologize for what I did because I didn't think I was biased towards the Blackhawks. I said, actually, I'm a Bay Area gal and I'm a Sharks fan. So I, I wasn't trying to be biased towards the Blackhawks, but I'll watch the broadcast back and see. And again, thanks for the critique. I hope you're doing okay. And that disarmed him. And I got an email a few days later that said, oh my goodness, you are such a pros pro. I was not expecting a response whatsoever, but the fact that you did, I'm going to cheer for you and everything else you call. I may not like your hockey calls, but wow, thank you so much for writing back. And so that's one of the ways I deal with criticism. I don't respond to everybody, but if I feel like somebody might be able to offer me something, you know, maybe I was blessed towards the Blackhawks and I watched the broadcast back. And there was a couple of times where I could have been, you know, more positive towards the blues. So I thought that was good. Um, so again, and take what you want, take what you can use, and people are going to tell you you suck and they don't like your voice. That's just, that's what we do. We're subjective, right? Some people are going to like people with blonde hair. Some people are going to like guys. Some are going to like, there's so many different layers to this. So I take the parts that I try to use, take stuff from people I respect, and always try to learn from it and get better. Because again, we're calling it live sports or we're covering live sports. So mistakes are bound to happen. It's just about trying not to make that same mistake twice. Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. Joe Buck's bio in his Twitter is, I don't cheer for your team. I mean, that's just him putting it out there, and uh, he's a good broadcaster. And I love that piece um, written. I actually read it this morning, so it was great uh, inspiration to an upcoming broadcaster like myself. Cool, cool. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of people get criticism over, you know, broadcasting especially, but other things, and it's interesting to see how everyone has a little take. Now, what's one, if you had to have one sentence to any young broadcasters, male or female, what would be your one piece of advice in this industry? Mm, one piece of advice, man. It's good that you asked for just a sentence because I'm sure you guys know after talking to a few of us, a few of us, I know you talked to Alex, who's an awesome NHL broadcaster recently. He, he reached out to me before the NHL game. Can't wait to meet him and thank him in person. Um, but you know that we could talk for hours about our <laughs> advice. But to bring it down to just one sentence, um, and obviously it's different for everybody, but the one that I come back to all the time is it's a Peruvian proverb and it's little by little, one walks far. 
Um, and it's taken me a long time to kind of wrap my head around the simplicity of it, but also how true it is. Because when I finished school at Cal, I remember thinking I was bound for ESPN and I was going to be famous in two years. And now, I'm, again, as I mentioned, 37, still haven't called anything for ESPN, but I'm having a damn great time and loving my journey. And it's taking my, me places I never could have imagined. And it really has just been about little by little. Take that one job as a radio traffic reporter and then take another step and move into sports radio and then take another step and be the sideline reporter for the San Jose Earthquakes and then take another and start calling high school football. And, you know, it's, it's really hard while you're doing it because you none of us are patient in this industry. We all want to be Joe Buck. We all want to be Jim Nance. We all want to be Beth Moans. We want to be at the top of the top right now. But in order to get there, just like them, you got to call a ton of games, just like everything else. You got to do those 10,000 hours. Um, so little by little, that's what I always come back to, because regardless of what industry you're in, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to wish you were higher and better and getting paid more. So it really helps me. And, and hopefully it'll be helpful to you, too, to just come back to that. And know that as long as you're taking a step each day, you're doing a podcast, you know, once a week, whatever it is. As long as you're taking steps in the direction that you want to go, you're going to get there. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm going to keep that with me. I actually have a journal that I like to write down some inspirational quotes from broadcasters, and that one's going in there for sure. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Miss Scott. Cortland, thank you for putting this together through some technical difficulties, even though we're missing Ian right now. Uh, episode 12. Thank you guys for watching.